Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. You ever read Cat in the Hat? <laughs> Dr. Seuss, I love, I love Dr. Seuss. Uh, one of my favorite books was Way Beyond Zebra. So I've always been intrigued by the things that are beyond the typical, beyond what you expect. And Way Beyond Zebra was this kid whose alphabet started after Z, you know, where the other alphabet stopped. It was all the, all the letters that were imaginary, fanciful, but not the ones you always think about, the, the apple through zebra. So this is kind of like the way beyond zebra for thyroid nutrients. <laughs> we're going to go past the selenium and the iodine and the, the big ones, but talk about some other ones you may not think of, but nonetheless are super important for good thyroid function and good health overall. So the first one I'm going to talk about is TMG. So not, not TMZ, the Hollywood thing, but no, TMG, that's trimethylglycine. And methyl is important. So people with thyroid disease, are, they're often not good methylators. You know, we're, we tend to have this MTHFR gene abnormality. And the drawback about that is a lot of critical chemical reactions involve methylation. And with that gene being off, you can't methylate as well as you would otherwise. So methylated glycine is one of the more effective ways to improve upon that reaction. And that's critical for detox, but it's also critical for making serotonin, you know, our good feel, good, happy brain chemical. So where do we get trimethylglycine? Supplementation is an option. We get that in beets as well. So beets have betaine, which is like a natural version of trimethylglycine. And great foods, you know, one of my favorite rules of thumb for healthy foods is that the more they stain the tablecloth, the better they are for you. <laughs> and beets are great examples of the, val the validity of that rule. So yeah, have beets regularly and better supplementation should also include trimethylglycine for those that have thyroid disease. Okay, so another one, we're way beyond zebra here. So let's think about molybdenum. Funny word, but I promise you can say it. So molybdenum. It's spelled like molly, but it's like molybdenum. Malub denum. <laughs> and this is an element, this is a mineral. It's not one of the ones that's as popularized like calcium or zinc, but we know now that it's completely essential. It's a big part of regulating fluoride within the body. So when molybdenum is lacking, you'd be more apt to build up fluoride in the thyroid. That's bad. It's also a critical thing for many of the phase one liver detox reactions, and also essential for sleep and energy production. Now, here's a paleo pitfall. You know, I love so many facets of the paleo diet. We all do better with quality protein, lots of veggies, lots of fresh food. But when you cut out intact whole grains and legumes, you just lost your molybdenum, along with fiber and many, many other important nutrients. But there's really no other good ways to get molybdenum in your foods. So most all, especially organic legumes and intact whole grains will have that. I'm a big fan of just all legumes, you know, uh, black beans, pinto beans, navy, northern, cannellinis, uh, split peas, they're all good stuff. Intact whole grains, gluten-free ones, wild rice, uh, black rice, quinoa, teff, uh, kamut, these, these are all great, great things. Intact whole grain oats, all things that contain molybdenum as well. So good, good to include. And same thing, better overall supplementation will also have that. Now we're going to move on to methyl B12. So B12 itself, there's many molecules that act like B12. There's cyanocobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, and methylcobalamin. Remember back at our trimethylglycine discussion about the whole methylation issue, if you've got thyroid disease, you're probably not methylating that well, so things that can be methylated, you might want to get them already methylated. So that's really true for B12 and folate. When they're not methylated, you can't use them. And B12, if you don't have it or you don't methylate it, that's a big deal. So your blood cells, your red blood cells are made from the same things you make into white blood cells. But when you make them into red blood cells, you shrink them a lot. They've got to be tiny to go outside of the capillaries, pop open, give your cells oxygen. You need that everywhere, but your brain and your nerves are crazy vulnerable to being even a little bit low in oxygen. And B12 allows those cells to shrink enough. So when there's no B12, we call that a megaloblastic anemia. The cells, they're immature, they're blastic stage, and they're big, they're megalo, like Megalodon the monster. <laughs> so yeah, you need those to shrink them and get oxygen around. 
You also need those for brain repair and nerve conduction. Without that, we see more nerve pain, more fatigue, and just poor mental function. Now, B12 itself, we only get that from animal foods. We cannot get that on a vegan diet without supplementation. And we do get that from dairy and eggs, not very high quantities. So really, this is animal flesh foods to get better amounts of B12. And supplementation, those with methylation issues, they may do worse with the cyano or the hydroxy versions. So methyl is the way to go. And a few micrograms can go a long way towards general health. Another fun one would be hesperitin. This is also called hesperitin methylchalcone. This is a special bioflavonoid. Many with thyroid disease have problems of connective tissue formation, which is where the dry skin comes in from. That same problem can also be a factor behind varicose veins and tendencies towards hemorrhoids and easy bruising. So hesperitin is just the best bioflavonoid for this. Where do you get this? Uh, citrus peels. So you don't want to eat the whole peel, but there's a part called the pith. Um, I'm not saying a foul word for urination. I'm saying pith, which is with a TH. So that is basically the inner lining. And it's actually really pleasant tasting. So my favorite trick is when you have oranges to eat them, rather than cut way down, I'll use a vegetable peeler and take off the outer layer, but leave the white stuff on there. It tastes pleasant and is really rich in tons of good bioflavonoids. The other food that's ridiculously high in that is buckwheat, which I've gushed about a lot. It's a wonderful favorite food of mine and excellent for the connective tissues and tasty and very slowly metabolized. So another big one we'll think about would be vitamin K2. Now this is called menaquinone, which is not the same as K1, which is the synthetic version of K. Both are important. We actually have some benefits from both of those, but we find this in a small number of foods, more so fermented foods. Probably miso and natto are the densest sources of K2. Now miso, I would encourage including. Now soy in general has rightfully been given a lot of attention in the thyroid world. Most versions of soy, those that have isoflavones, are probably counterproductive. They can worsen thyroid autoimmunity. But the fermented versions that are rich in K2 are helpful and they're also good things for the flora. So enjoy your naturally brewed miso. And if you've not had natto before, next time you're at a sushi place, ask for a natto roll. <laughs> it's, a uh, hmm, what's the color like? It's about the color of brown rice, but, and then like little chunks, it's got little chunks and it's very stringy, almost kind of like melted cheese, but not quite. <laughs> and it is an acquired taste. I actually like it now. The first few times I'm like, oh wow, it's, I'm not going to lie to you, it tastes like it's gone bad. It tastes like it's kind of like a sour thing, like they shouldn't be serving that. <laughs> it was left out somewhere too long, but I've, I've come to like it. And if you read up on natto, you know, natto kinase, for example, is a very powerful, good enzyme for breaking down fibrinogen in the body. Natto is a crazy healthy food, you know, a lot of big benefits from it, but it's ridiculously high in vitamin K2, so worth probably including. Here's another one that we've heard a bit about, not quite far beyond zebra, but some things would be, and that's D3. So the weird thing about D, well, I guess not so much weird, is that we've got a sweet spot. You know, for a long time, we knew that if you were really deficient in vitamin D, it was bad for your bones. That was about the end of the discussion. We figured once you had a few hundred micrograms of D, you were all set, no need to, th need to think about it. Then the data started rolling in that vitamin D affected chronic pain, and that vitamin D affected the immune system and that every disease you could shake a stick at was worse if you were too low in vitamin D. So for a while we thought, oh wow, we want a lot of vitamin D. You wanna be in this high side of the curve. Then we started seeing data coming in about vitamin D and mortality. You know, how, how much vitamin D someone has in their body and how long they live, you know, population's longevity. And what that showed was that being at the highest end of that range was actually a bad thing for mortality. So now we've said, okay, so it's not about just avoiding the deficiency and it's not about taking a ton of it, it's about being in that sweet spot. And honestly, could have seen it coming. We've seen that same thing with just every facet of hormones and nutrients. It's about the sweet spot. <laughs> and for D, the sweet spot, I wish this wasn't the case, but it's a narrow sweet spot. In terms of nanograms per mil in your blood, it's probably about 40 to 50. You know, if you're much lower, you start looking at deficiency problems. And if you're much higher, you start 
eroding away those longevity benefits. There's no way around testing for it because not everyone achieves the same blood level at the same dose. So you've got to check your levels. My experience is that most people do about three to 5,000 IUs per day. We'll put them at that sweet spot. Many need more. And by most people, I'd say probably 60, 70%. So a fair chunk of people need to take more. And there are some that need to take less where that would be too much for them. So you've got to test it at least once a year and adjust your dose. If your scores are off, I would test more often until it's dialed in and then screen it once a year. Make it part of your routine process that way. In terms of the forms, you want vitamin D3. You want it with, with your food. So last one is vitamin B1 or thiamine. Now this is critical for utilizing T3, for getting T3 across your cell membranes. This is also critical in terms of just general energy production for those that have thyroid disease. This is not too tough to get from supplementation. Many medications do deplete thiamine, and alcohol does deplete it also. So good things to think about. So way past zebra, um, two bonuses to leave you with on the opposite end. Those were important nutrients to get. So here's important nutrients to avoid. <laughs> and I've said this before, but I will beat this drum as far as I need to. You want to avoid supplemental iodine. There is no, so here's the story. So if someone has thyroid storm, which is like the worst complication of Graves' disease, the medications that slow the overactive thyroid in Graves' disease, they take about six, four to six weeks to work. They do not work right now. So when someone is in emergency room type danger from the thyroid storm, their thyroid is cranking out tons of hormone. How, how do they stop that in the moment in the emergency room? What do you do to stop the thyroid when you've got to stop it like right now? You give iodine. Yep, you give iodine, and that's the standard of care. The reason for it is your thyroid is so iodine hungry that a flood, a surge of iodine, shuts the whole thing off. <laughs> Otherwise, it would make way too much hormone. That's the most surefire way to end thyroid storm is with a big dose of iodine. And that big dose, when you've got thyroid autoimmunity, is not really a big dose anymore. It's only more than about 300 micrograms. So don't do multis, don't take iodine supplements, and even don't eat high iodine foods if you're trying to lower your thyroid antibodies and reverse your hypothyroid symptoms. Last one is folic acid. So thyroid disease means MTHFR abnormalities. Folic acid is a carcinogen for everyone in those contexts. So look for that in your supplements, avoid that. A lot of the people that have had issues with processed grains have had issues with folic acid. I'm not a fan of processed grains by any means, but one of several bad things about them is that they're fortified with synthetic folic acid. And that can be the source of many symptoms and many cons complications. So beyond zebra, some more important nutrients to dial in your thyroid. Back with you really soon. Take great care.